here we are again folks this is brother Peter with tidbits from the word so proud to be with you again today I would like to establish <clears throat> some things in the Bible today we're going to look in the book of Romans and the book of Romans if we started uh, for instance today and we were going to do 10 different excerpts on the book of Romans uh, it wouldn't cover the whole book. You'd have to just scan it to do that. You'd have to have 30 or 40 <laughs> to cover the book of Romans. Paul clarifies in the book of Romans, he clarifies sin as sin, and, and that is called unrighteousness. And then he clarifies righteousness as not sin, as what God is. He is righteousness. The opposite from sin. These are two opposites. There is opposite as night and day. And the two do not mix. If you want to expel sin out of your life, you have to turn the light of righteousness on. When you turn the light of righteousness on in your life, it will expel sin. If you allow sin to come into your life, it will expel a type of expelling the righteousness in your life. Now we're talking about two different things. The spiritual man can overcome the sin. The fleshly man has a war on a continual basis daily to fight off the uh, darts, the fiery darts, the Bible said, that the devil throws at us on a daily basis. He throws fiery darts at our flesh on a daily basis to see if he can get us to trip up. Could, if, if you were asked today, if somebody accused you today of being a Christian, could you prove that you are? Could you prove that you are a Christian? Or can you prove you are a child of God? Can you absolutely, positively stand on the fact that you are a child of God? I want to, before I get in completely, to the book of Romans this morning. I have been doing some studying today, excuse me. I have been doing some studying today on uh, some different things. And a, a right measure, a right measure. I remember a story I heard about a f farmer that was swapping butter for, uh, another, for some other commodity. And uh, as he was swapping the butter for this other commodity, the man came to him one day and he said, you know, your butter is less than a pound. What are you using on the other scale uh, that you're weighing that butter? And he said, I'm using the pound you bring me. Whatever the pound was that man was bringing him, he was using it in the scale for a measure. So he was actually trading pound for pound what it was. But the man was get, cheating him on the pound, and by doing that, he cheated his own self. And we as Christians, if we follow the, anything of the devil whatsoever, we're cheating our own selves. Not only that, we are making a mockery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that Jesus walked on this earth 33 years, 100% sinless? I'm talking about sinless. He was God in the flesh. He walked here sinless, yet he wasn't proud. He washed the feet of the disciples. He was not a proud human being, even though he could have been. He didn't come and take over and say, Hey, look, I'm God. Y'all just step back out of the way. No. He mingled. And matter of fact, one of the partners that traveled with him during his three-year trek on this earth of his working trek was the devil himself, the son of perdition, hooked up with Jesus, carried the money bag, carried the money bag, walked the streets with Jesus, and Jesus did not cast him out, did not rebuke him, did not put him away. He showed that he could walk side by side with the devil on this earth and not sin, and not, not be uh, ugly to him, and not be... Uh, bring a reproach on himself because of ugliness. Look, the right measure of civilization, the right measure of civilization and 
progress is going to come through a spiritual awakening in this world. This world needs a spiritual awakening. It's too bad that God had to, the only way he could wake up his children, the children of Israel, that started with a righteous man, Abraham, the first man who paid tithes, the first man who was saved by faith. Abraham was saved by faith. He had faith in God. Whatever God said, he did. When God said, step, he stepped. When God said, walk, he walked. When God said, don't walk, he didn't walk. He did exactly what God told him to do by faith. And it was counted for him for righteousness. The same exact righteousness that you and I have through Jesus Christ. By the way, Abraham went to his own Abraham's bosom. He was the guy that was in the heart of the earth and he was the guy that had the, uh, if you please, the circled in place down there in the heart of the earth across from hell it was called paradise. And Abraham was there and he had all, A-L-L, -L, every single solitary, all of the Old Testament saints down there with him until Jesus came shed his blood on the cross and then took paradise which was Abraham and all of Abraham's children to heaven and set them down at, with God and so this was the righteousness of God being fulfilled in Jesus Christ on this earth no other no no way could anybody else go uh, and step into the presence of God other than through the blood of Jesus Christ Christ and every step of progress has been from right to right if you're a Christian every step of progress in your life has been from one right thing to another right thing if it's progress if you step from a right thing to a wrong thing you've got a, a black and night and day mix not just black and white but it's a night and day mix it's two opposites and they do not mix. It's like oil and water. You might for a few minutes disguise a little oil by whipping it up in some water, but you let it set a few minutes and the oil is going to separate and come to the top. It is actually going to smother the water out. The water, the pure water, something good to drink, smother it out with the oil on top of it. And this is, this is like, this is what sin will do to righteousness. I do not allow sin. Do not allow known sin to come in your life. Try your best to not allow unknown sin to come in your life. But you won't let known sin come in your life if you will strive to follow Jesus. Ask Him on a daily basis. When you get up in the morning, pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray the prayer. The Lord's Prayer in John 17 is not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about in Matthew 6 and 9 where Jesus taught 12 disciples how to pray. He said to them, when you pray, pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Wow. That is talking to your Father in heaven. You should do that every single solitary day. You should start your day with that prayer. And if you do, and then follow it through the day. <laughs> Let me tell you what. If you get that prayer, pray it 28 days straight, and you'll pray it every day the rest of your life. But you pray it 28 days straight, you'll pray it the rest of your life. But let me tell you this, not just praying it, but getting it. I tell you what, if you pray that prayer in the morning and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a, a Christian brother offends you, just cuts you out and slices you up, offends you, it won't offend you. And if, if a worldly man offends you, it won't offend you. Because you've already asked God to allow you to forgive your brother. And by the way, uh, one of the disciples came to Jesus and said, Hey, <laughs> how many times I got to forgive this bird? 
I mean, he's a thorn in my flesh. How many times have I got to forgive him? And Jesus said 70 times 7 in one day. <laughs> Whoa, that's 490 times in one day. Wow, man, you may live next to a neighbor that you have to forgive 490 times in one day. I tell you what, if you'll do, if you'll follow the pattern I just laid out, and you'll do that, you'll win that man to the Lord. He may not come to the Lord until after you die. You may live under the plague until you die. And after you die, he'll say, you know, that man was righteous. He was right. I won't follow that pattern. And you'll see it from heaven and not from this earth. Ah. We have right is right. The solution to the problem is try not to mix right and wrong together. Do you know what wrong is? Wrong is something that can appear right, but has a dagger up its sleeve. Look at this here. Uh, by William Shakespeare said this. Who's quoting William Shakespeare when you got the Bible? But here's a guy. He said, <laughs> he said fools make a mock at sin. Do you know something? From what William Shakespeare has said right here, he may have been a man that had a heart for God. We may not have seen it from the outside. What he had on the inside might have been different than what he showed on the outside. Will not believe it carries such a dagger in its sleeve. Sin carries a dagger in its sleeve. William Shakespeare was talking about, uh, back in the 15, 1600s, was talking about a day different than today when men wore cloaks and jackets and everything, when uh, there was a, a group of people on the earth that actually carried knives in their sleeves, would actually walk by a person and stick them in the gut and keep on walking, and they would fall dead. Listen, Deuteronomy 6 and 18, let's look at this. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee. I teach uh, fifth grade boys in my Sunday school. I, I challenge them to do things all the time. I also challenge them is God is their witness. If they lie, they're going to have to live with that lie on their conscience until they ask forgiveness from God and many times from the person they lied to. So therefore, if you uh, have the thought in your mind, if I lie, God's going to see it. God's going to be the first one to smite my heart. That's a lie. So the best thing to do if you tell a lie is to turn right around and say, look, that wasn't the whole truth. <laughs> I need to back up on that and switch. Switch and switching back and taking care of the problem before it becomes a problem. If it's wrong, make it right. If it's wrong, make it right. Immediately. Switch it. Uh, do you know you can change something to appear beautiful? And it can be poison. Uh, wrong prompts a new appeal. Wrong prompts a new appeal. Trying to make it appeal as something beautiful and good and nice when it's wrong is just dressing it up. And you can dress it up, but rotten's rotten. <laughs> right. Hey, have you ever cut a cantaloupe open? It looks so good and you say, boy, this smells like it's just right, ripe, just perfect. You cut that thing open and it's just mush inside. The outside of it lied to you, and <laughs> the inside of it showed you the truth. It wasn't good. It had gone by its time. So wrong is wrong. You don't hide deception in your life. Don't hide things in your life. Anything. Don't hide anything. Can you stand right now, this very minute, before the God of heaven and say, I'm not hiding anything in my life, God. I am an open book to you. You take me and use me today. I, Brother Peter, set before you today. 
and say to God, search me, Lord. Not that I'm perfect, but in Christ I am perfect. In Christ I'm righteous. I love the fact that God said that David was a man after my own heart. This is a man you and I would fault many times for his physical actions that he did. But God did not fault him in the big sense of the word for his physical actions other than the one that God mentioned was the matter of Uriah. Other than that, God doesn't mention those things about David. He said he was a man of my own heart. You know what that tells me? That tells me that any sin that is recorded about our brother David, any sin that's recorded about our brother David was a sin that was recorded by somebody else and not by God. God did not record that sin. He forgave David of it instantly and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. Never more to be remembered. You know how I know that? Because at the end, after David went on to be with the Father, he said that David was a man after my own heart. And God did not fault David for those things that David did in the flesh other than some type of loss of reward or whatever. And you and I don't understand that yet and will not understand it until we get to heaven. Right does not tolerate wrong. Right does not tolerate wrong. Wow. Dress as you please or cover it as you will. Right centers on something worthier than the assemblance of it. I was just thinking, you could dress a man in a dress, put lipstick on his lips, put a wig on his head, make him look just like a woman. Truth of the matter is, he's a man. And you can't change that. And this world today is saying that it's okay to dress a man as a woman. Allow him to act wrongly as a woman, as a man, and act wrongly as he was a woman. And it's okay. I'm here to tell you today, it's not okay. That is not okay. That is an abomination to God, the Lord God of heaven, the Creator. It's an abomination for a man to try to appear as a woman. Well, it's an abomination from the devil. It came from hell. It got Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. It got the children of Israel completely wiped off the earth. Just about 100% wiped off the earth two or three times because of that degradation. That's a degradation that will come on this earth which will bring the sword of God upon this earth. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. We can't tolerate the wrong. We, as Christians... We can't tolerate a dressing up a sin and have it in our midst because we dress it up. So we must be careful about that. Uh, right has a built-in reward and wrong has a curses built in. Wrong has curses built in and right has reward built in. So just remember that you're going to get a dagger in the center of your heart and life if you tolerate wrong. Do you know what love? Love wins. Love is a winning quality. Love is a winning... I did a few excerpts last week on love. Love is a winning quality. It wins when everything else fails. Love wins when everything else fails. Wow. You may have a nasty neighbor. You may have a neighbor that gets up in the morning and cusses you across the fence. You may have a neighbor that throws his limbs over your fence continually. What you need to do is take those uh, limbs while the neighbor's watching and cut them up and put them in a barrel and burn them and take care of them and say nothing and say nothing and say nothing. <laughs> Jesus said to the devil, it is written, it is written, it is written, and that's all. And it is written, 
If your neighbor throws his limbs over your fence, get rid of them and keep your mouth shut and take care of the thing and you'll win your neighbor. You win your neighbor by love. You can't win many people by knocking them. You'll never win anybody if you knock them. Be careful. Be careful. Are you a soul winner? Are you a soul winner? Are you a winner? You can, I had an uncle. He didn't say hardly two words and everybody came to me and said, Hey, Pete, he's the best preacher I ever met. He's the best Christian I ever met. He didn't say hardly two words. He didn't knock anybody about anything. And he was considered one of the best preachers. Ah, uh, don't be fussing at people. Don't be listen. If your neighbor throws his limbs over there, don't fuss at him, and don't tell the other neighbors about him. Go burn the limbs. Drag the limbs over there, cut them up, and burn them while he's watching. And say nothing. And you know what? You will receive a crown of righteousness in heaven. <laughs> you might not see it on this earth, but you will receive it in heaven. By the way, your other neighbors who are watching you burn those limbs that man threw over your fence it, or pick up his trash. If he comes in at night and he's drunk and he drinks a can of beer and he throws a can over the fence on your side or on your side of the driveway with no fence there, you go out and you politely pick it up and put it in a bag and put it in a trash can and keep your mouth shut. You will win that man. You will win that person. Listen, light expels darkness. Light expels darkness. It won't be long the light in your yard will push over and shine into his yard. And as it gets closer and closer to his house, it's going to start working on his heart. What is, what is our commission? Why am I here? Why, Brother Peter, why are you here? I'll tell you that, why I'm here. You want me to tell you why I'm here? I'm here because God wants to use me to show others that they can live this kind of life. That they can live this kind of life. They can live a life of righteousness. They can live a life of light. And love is the sun. <laughs> ah against whose melting beams the winter cannot stand. How about that? The winter can't stand against the sun. The sun melts the winter away. The snow, the ice, the freezing cold, the sun melts it away slowly on a daily basis and spring comes in. If you will be the sun in your neighborhood, if you will be the sun in your house, if you will be the sun at the filling station, if you will be the sun at the gas pumps, if you will be the sun in the Sunday school room, if you will be the sun in the vestibule of the church, if you will be the sun when you're walking up a mountain path and you meet somebody, and if you will be the sun wherever you go, you will expel darkness. Light expels darkness. So you've got to be the sun wherever you go. Wow, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful in life, what you do. Love wins when politics fails. <laughs> That's probably going to be the famous American saying, when politics fails. Discerning not what the politician is trying to put across is uh, uh, listen we have a group today in this world a group of people who are not following God who are trying to put across on to the Christian that we have to follow their precepts and their ways the ways of the devil we do not have to do that we can follow God and not be at a complete opposition we love him Jesus because he first loved us. Wow. My time, you know, is getting out of the way here. I had planned on doing a 10 minute on this, and I'm now in the 25th minute. I'm going to go ahead and make this a 30 minute. Overcoming 
life's anxieties. And in the book of Luke, Jesus speaking here, he talked about consider the lilies, how they grow, and they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. What God is saying here, and Jesus is saying here, he is saying no matter what man does, no matter how man dresses up something, it will never be as pure as that lily. God made that lily. He told that lily what to do. He told it exactly what to do. That lily does exactly what it's supposed to do. And if you please, the proper lily is going to be the proper lily. Just exactly what God said. The obedience of it. The obedience of that lily is the beauty of it. It is a beautiful thing. But the beauty of it is, is that it hasn't changed from the day God made it. Where man did, if you remember, he sinned in the garden. And, and by the way, Eve stepped just outside of the garden, I believe. When she stepped outside of the garden, she met the devil. When she stepped outside of the, the protection of her husband, she was away from her husband for some reason when she met the devil. And I have this picture by studying that, that, that Eve had already been begun and Adam came along all of a sudden a few minutes later. What happened? There was some kind of separation. Don't allow separation from righteousness in your life. If you allow separation from righteousness in your life, you immediately fall into the abyss, fall off the cliff of unrighteousness. You'll fall off the cliff of unrighteousness the second you don't protect yourself. You've got to, listen, righteousness has to be protected. It has to be protected. 24 sevens, every second. There's 60 seconds in a minute. And in those seconds, there are milliseconds. If you took those, you took one of those seconds and broke it into 60 pieces, you got a millisecond of a 60th of a second. It all boils down to the molecule of time. And you got to stay on the ball. This is why God said, and Jesus said right here about the lily. The lily hasn't one second changed anything. Nothing. It's the same exact lily God put in the field. Hadn't changed a bit. Where man has. Where man has. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, ye of little faith? This is Jesus talking in Luke. He said, God clothes every bright of grass that grows with a green color. He clothes that every blade of grass. It's his grass. And it's doing exactly what he told it to do. And it's doing, it's not changed itself. It's doing, so he said, do the same. Seek ye not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Neither be ye of a doubtful mind. He's saying doubt is a sin. Don't be of a doubtful mind. You ask God, He'll give you what you need when you need it. I don't believe that you and I probably, the majority of us, have ever, ever, ever really been hungry to death. If you've been hungry to death, then you have a, a different situation, you can see. But rather seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Put your heart at rest. He has blessings, understandings waiting for us that we know not of. Our time has come and gone. This brother Peter with tidbits from the word. Been proud to be with you. Listen, my life is given over 100% to God. My will in my life is that God comes and does his will through me, this body, and uses it in the future in the way that he would have it be used. I love 
to uh, teach and the things that God has taught me and pass them on to you. Whoever you are out there, may God bless you this day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.